I, I, I resisted uh, applying the word addiction to, to technology for a long time, simply because I think it's a different form of addiction than say, you know, drug addiction or alcohol addiction or nicotine addiction. Um, but I do think, I do think at this point, it's fair to call it an addiction. I mean, certainly it's fair to call it a compulsion. And I think we've all of us who have phones or even internet access know what that feels like, that desire to constantly reach for our phone. Um, I think dealing with it means providing more space for our, our minds to think in different ways without being uh, intruded on by the distractions or simply the presence of our phones and other technology. Today on Nelda Live, we're excited to have the provocative technology author, Nicholas Carr. Nicholas has spent decades thinking about the role of technology in our lives, and he has some bad news. Our phones and our overuse of the internet are ruining our minds. He wants us to really think about how much we use these devices, the consequences of their overuse, and to inspire us to make some changes. Nicholas, welcome. So good to have you here. Thanks for joining us on Nelda Live. You're welcome. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Oh, so good. Um, so we are all kind of uh, dependent on this phone right here, right? Um, so it's an amazing device. In many ways, we can uh, communicate instantly. We can find ourselves uh, pinpoint with our GPS where we are, help us find our way on a map. Um, we can just have a simple search right at our fingertips. So it's kind of a wonderful little thing, this tool here. But uh, you're going to kind of rain on our parade today. So at a high level, what problem are you seeing with our phone use? Well, I think there are several, but the, the one I concentrate on is that it is a constant distraction to us. We, you know, we've We've taken it for granted that we need to carry our phone with us all day long. Most people, they first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is look at their phone. Last thing they do before going to bed is look at their phone. And we've never had a device, a technology that's with us all the time. And what happens is it's constantly grabbing part of our mind, part of our attention, constantly distracting us. So on the one hand, if we have all these conveniences, we have all these riches of information and messages. On the other hand, uh, I think we're thinking more shallowly, more superficially, because we're in this constant state of distractedness, thanks to our phones and other related technologies. Before we dive in a little bit deeper, I'd kind of like to get to know, who is Nicholas Carr? So where do you hail from? What can you tell us about you? Well, I, I'm from New England. I, I, I live in uh, Massachusetts right now. Uh, I've been a writer uh, for couple of decades, uh, editor before that. I uh, am a visiting professor at, of sociology at Williams College here in Massachusetts. Um, and that's about the size of it. <laughs> well, how did you get into thinking about our issues with technology? Um, because that really is where a lot of your latest focus has been. So tell us about that. How did you get it, that involved? Yeah. So it, it kind of, comes out of my love of technology. Um, mm. I have been, as I said, a technology and science writer for a long time, uh, big fan of computers, personal computers, big fan of the internet when it came along. But about, I'd say a dozen years ago, 2008, 2007, I began to realize that I seemed to be losing my ability to concentrate, to focus my mind. And what I began to realize or began to suspect was that it was all the time I was spending online uh, in front of a computer screen was training my mind to want to be constantly stimulated to Google stuff, to get emails, to send messages, to read headlines. Um, and I began doing research into how our brains are affected by technology and the history of technology. And so that's where my worries turned into more concrete concerns. Um, so it's really, it began as a, I guess you'd say, as a, an attempt at self-diagnosis to figure out what was going on inside my own mind. And, and then that broadened out from there. So let's talk about that thinking. Um, how are we really supposed to be thinking? What, um, what should the conditions, the perfect conditions be for thinking? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, a hard question. I, I don't think there's one set of conditions uh, that are perfect for all kinds of thinking. And, and I, you know, I think one of the great things or maybe the greatest thing about the human mind is it's capable of thinking in all sorts of ways. And all, all of those ways are valuable in different settings. But what I do believe, and I believe this is what sets us apart from other animals, and it's what's particularly difficult for a, a person to master, is what I'll call deep thinking which means you concentrate your mind on one particular thing, a train of thought, a, a book you're reading, anything, and you get into this, this ability to be deeply contemplative, um, not just you know taking in information or shooting out information, but thinking very, very deeply about whatever it is you're thinking about. And it's at that uh, it's those kinds of very calm, very attentive thinking that I believe unlocks the full potential of the human mind. You know, it's interesting, Nicholas, because I've had, I talked to Greg McEwen with his book, Essentialism, and then I recently spoke with Keith Cunningham, and each one of them talked about, you know, scheduling thinking time because of the way our world is and how important it is to really set that time away where you're away from technology. So, I guess my question is, is technology distracting us or is it actually changing the way we think? Well, I think both. Um, I think it's uh, what we know from, from recent research is that particularly uh, phones, which because we carry with them all the time, but in general, the online world and the world of computer screens is highly distracting because it's so packed with information and, and, and often little bits of information, new information coming at us all the time. But what happens, and, and we know this from brain scientists' study, recent studies of the brain in their discovery of the brain's what they call neuroplasticity, which means our brains are constantly adapting at a biological level, at an anatomical level to our surroundings, uh, adapting to the way we're using our brain, that as we essentially enter this digital world of constant distraction, constant multitasking, constant juggling of information, our brains naturally try to optimize for that way of thinking. So we become very good at being distracted uh, and being superficial and being information gatherers. But at the same time, we begin to lose the ability to get into that deeper state of very attentive thinking, contemplative thinking, because the brain, the brain simply adapts to our habits of thought and it optimizes for, for whatever we're using our brain for a lot, uh, but then begins to lose the abilities that we're not practicing. And I think that's what's been going on with, uh, with smartphones and other digital technologies. So why are these such a magnet for us? What, what is it about their makeup that makes us so distracted and for one thing, I think human beings are by nature information gatherers. We want to know everything going on around us. And we particularly want to know any piece of new information that comes along. And, and I think this has lo uh, deep um, uh, evolutionary roots. You can imagine, you know, in ages past, knowing everything that was going on around you in the environment, whether it was a predator or a source of food or something, helped you survive. So our brains uh, evolved to want to be distracted, <laughs> to want to gather information. Uh, what we do with, in the digital world, what we've done with the digital world is created uh, an environment of unlimited and constant bits of new information that grabs our mind. And this has been amplified, I think, further by the smartphone itself. There was, there's been some very interesting studies that show that because we've become so dependent on our phones for all sorts of things, but certainly for communication with other people, um, what happens is our, our phone is always on our mind. It's always grabbing part of our attention, even if we're not using it. Um, what's, it it's a, an example of what psychologists refer to as salience. Uh, our mind tends to be attracted to what's ever mo most salient or important in our uh, environment at any given moment. And with the smartphone, we've, we've created what one scientist calls uh, a device of supernormal salience because so much is in it, our photographs, our social lives, uh, news, entertainment, everything. 
Um, it's got it's got a lot of salience, a lot of importance to us at any at every single moment. And because we carry it with us, that means it's constantly uh, grabbing at our minds, you know, certainly when we're using it, when it's notifying us, alerting us. But even when we're not using it, even when it's just nearby, uh, our minds, the sign shows, shows, feels the pull of the phone. And it's a very, very strong pull. As anybody who has a phone knows, and if has anybody who watches people with phones know, uh, we really get into this kind of a, almost addictive, certainly compulsive kind of behavior uh, in desiring to check our phones all the time. So which of our activities cause most of the problems? Is it, you know, we're talking about texting, you know, Facebook, email, browsing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think in, in some ways, it's the fact that we have all of these things available to us all the time. I mean, when I started writing about this, as I said, about a dozen years ago, this was just when the smartphone had been introduced and just in the early days of social media. And it was still an issue, at least for me, and I think for other people uh, back then. So I think it's the, it's that, that it does so much and it's constantly giving us information of all sorts of different, in all sorts of different ways and all sorts of different types and all sorts of uh, different kind of modes. But I do think that uh, particularly in recent years, what we've seen is that the most distracting uh, and certainly the most addictive uh, of the technologies is social media. And, and the reason for that, I think, is A, you know, social media apps like uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and TikTok, they're very carefully designed to get us, keep, get us to keep coming back for more. But also they, they have a lot of social importance to us. They're constantly giving us signals of our social status. You know, every, anytime somebody likes uh, Instagram you, po- you put up or comments on a Facebook post you made, that is somehow influencing your social status. And one thing we know about our psychology is that we're intensely interested in monitoring our social status. So it's social media, really, I think these days, that is the big culprit. Given that we can find out just about anything online, though, aren't we getting smarter or more knowledgeable about things? Unfortunately, I don't think so. And that was the theory early on. You know, everybody was very excited, myself included, that by giving us simple access to all sorts of information that used to either be impossible to get or hard to get or expensive to get, that we would become knowledgeable. I think what we've learned since then is that having access to information is great, but it doesn't really tell us how deeply we're thinking about that information. I mean, when you step back and consider it, you know, gathering information is only the first step in thinking uh, about information. The second step is actually concentrating on whatever information you've gathered, uh, thinking deeply about it. And to do that well, you have to turn off the distractions. You have to, you have to step back from the flow of information and really concentrate. Uh, and that becomes harder and harder when we're constantly gathering information. So, so what I think what we've learned is it's not just the amount of information available to us that determines the depth of our thinking. It's how that information is presented. And I think, unfortunately, our, our phones and the Internet in general presents information in a kind of constant blur that ends up undermining deep thinking rather than rather than reinforcing. It. So, Nicholas, for years I've heard that we are all communicating more, the world's getting smaller, we can talk to someone all the way around the world at any moment, instantly talk to them, um, and that it's all going to bring us together, improve uh, how people relate to one another. Is that true? Unfortunately, I I think that's turned out to be another myth uh, about technology, about modern technology. It, it, let me let me begin by saying, you know, I, th- I think it's great that we have these communication tools. And certainly for a lot of people who have felt isolated, who have felt like they didn't have a voice in the past, this, this has been very valuable, these technologies. But again, what we've learned, and we should have known this from studies of human psychology before, is that when you give people endless amounts of information, unfiltered information that they can collect what we tend to do, unfortunately, is we tend to collect information that reinforces our biases, that reinforces our, um, our, our existing patterns of thought, our existing beliefs, our existing views. And when you constantly gather more and more information that reinforces your biases, those biases become stronger. 
Um, and what happens then is is what we're seeing these days, I, I think, is that people become more and more, more polarized and unable to appreciate other people's points of view, unable to think about compromising, uh, you know, you know, with their views and with other people with different views. Um, so what so what I think we've learned is that there is a danger, actually, in unlimited amounts of communication, because p it tends to bring uh, people together into kind of uh, a tr kind of clans or almost tribes of beliefs, mm -hmm. um, rather than encouraging people to broaden their perspective and understand other people's perspective, which is what we hope the technology would do. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think it is doing that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of the things that I always talk to people about is civility, um, the the value of debate, the value of uh, of how conservatives need liberals, that how everybody needs each other, and we need to bring it all to the table together. But civility does seem to be lost, and I think it is part of that. What you're describing sounds just exactly like what you know what we're seeing, and certainly um, talking about. Hopefully, that it actually gets out into our, our society as. Um, a cultural understanding of, of how this is hurting us. Um, right. But what evidence is there? Well, let's go back to some of your brain uh, research that you were talking about, that the screen time is affecting us, our brains, and our relationships negatively. You know, even before the technology came along, there was, there was lots and lots of research about how distractions and multitasking undermine our thinking and, and right. make us more superficial get in the way of problem solving, get in the way of deep thinking. In the last, particularly in the last 10 years or so, there's been, there's now been a whole lot of research on uh, computers, the internet, smartphones, and how they influence our thinking. And I think, I think the evidence is pretty clear and pretty compelling at this point um, that, that whenever, whenever our phones are around us, they are very much grabbing part of our attention. Uh, there was a very interesting study a few years ago out of the uh, University of Texas in Austin that showed that um, even when people even when people turn their phones off, uh, when they when they take uh, tests of their intelligence, taste, tests of their cognitive ability, the closer their phone is to them, literally, uh, the less well they do on those tests. Wow. Um, and in the researchers, what the researchers interpreted that as meaning is that we become so used, we're, we've trained ourselves to want all the information coming from our phones, and we know it's always there, uh, that it really is a kind of drag on our attention and ultimately uh, the richness of our thoughts. And we've seen similar studies done in schools, for instance, that if, if a student has a phone with them in class, at a lecture class, for instance, even if they're not using it, they'll do worse on a test of their retention of the material in the class simply because they're they're in effect they're they're sharing their mind with their phone whatever else they're doing now so so i think the cognitive evidence at this point is is quite strong that this is undermining the the richness of our thought i think the emotional the evidence on its a the emotional toll um is is let is still earlier on. So, so I think I, I don't want to overreach and say that we know exactly how this is affecting us emotionally. Um, there are suggested suggestions that this constant, this sense of being constantly on display and so on social media leads to uh, kind of nervousness, anxiety, tension. It, there are, there's some evidence that being constantly distracted not only undermines cognition, but may undermine empathy. But as I say, I, I think though those streams of research are still early on. So, so I think we need to, we, I think more research needs to be done about how uh, the technology influences us emotionally, uh, because we still, I don't think it, I don't think it's all clear yet there. So it's interesting that someone is actually researching empathy with this. So what what is that research looking like? There's a couple of different uh, types of research going on. Uh, one type simply simply suggests that uh, empathy is one of the more complex and sophisticated emotions that we feel. And in the I, the the theory is that unlike say fear, which is very visceral and is shared by all animals, um, empathy is a more recently developed emotion in the brain. Um, and like deep thinking, the theory goes, uh, 
uh, these kind of deep emotions like empathy actually take time mm. to emerge in our minds. And so if we're constantly distracted, uh, it can be harder to develop that kind of rich feeling of empathy for other people. Um, the other stream of research uh, is similar to what I talked about earlier with cognition, which is, for instance, there was a, a very interesting study that had strangers get into a conversation, a 10 minute conversation uh, with each other about, about various topics. They had a whole bunch of groups of two people do this. Some of them had their phones with them uh, and some of them had to leave their phones in a different room. And what they found is uh, pretty significantly that the people who talked with their phones near them reported lower levels of trust in the person they were talking to, lower levels of empathy, lower satisfaction with the conversation. So again, there, there seems to be some indication that, uh, that the technology is sapping us uh, emotionally as well as cognitively. Wow. <laughs> I have, that's a wow moment for me. That's really, really interesting. Um, so is it fair to call our dependence on these an addiction? Um, and if so, yeah, I, how do we start getting out of it? I mean, you know, I mean, I do think I, I, I resisted uh, applying the word addiction to, to technology for a long time, simply because I think it's a different form of addiction than say, you know, drug addiction or alcohol addiction or nicotine addiction. Um, but I do think, I do think at this point, it's fair to call it an addiction. I mean, certainly it's fair to call it a compulsion. And I think we've all of us who have phones or even internet access, know what that feels like, that desire to constantly reach for our phone. Um, I think dealing with it means providing more space for our, our minds to think in different ways without being uh, intruded on by the distractions or simply the presence of our phones and other technology. And, and to make that more practical, I think we, I think we have to resist what we've taught ourselves to do, which is to carry our phones with us all the time. I think if we're gonna if if we're gonna open up old uh, and calm ways of thinking, if we're gonna open those back up to us, then we have to spend time in our day every day without our phones nearby, without technology nearby. And so, and this is gonna be hard for lots of people. It's hard for me. Um, I, I think the most, the single most important a person thing a person can do is to go out and do things without having their phone with them, whether it's taking a walk, having a conversation with somebody, having a meal, going to class, going to work. I mean, if we can start to say, do I really need my phone with me when I go out to do this? I think what we'll learn is that there's a whole lot of activities that are actually more enjoyable and more fulfilling if you do them with your full attention, with your full concentration and without being constantly distracted by technology. So what do you then recommend? Let's just say a recommendation of how people reconnect outside of this. Um, how do they control technology in their lives? So, uh, well, starting, you know, with my suggestion that you don't carry your phone around with you all the time. I think that's that's a powerful way to to kind of mute <laughs> the the influence of the technology on your mind and on your emotions. Second, I, I think we need to recognize that the companies that uh, develop phones and develop apps and develop social media, they want us to be constantly distracted, particularly by their products and services. And they've designed these things, uh, particularly the social media platforms, to be something that it has an addic addiction like hold on us. So I think, you know, tempering your use of social media, uh, taking some of your social media apps off your phone um, so you can't check them all the time, turning off notifications because this is another way that uh, the companies who want to grab our attention grab our attention by constantly notifying us of new information or whatever. Um, so there, I think there are some, you know, practical, simple things, even though they're difficult because we've so trained ourselves to, to want to gather information all the time. And that, but then broader than that, we also need to recognize that this is no longer just a pers a matter of personal discipline. We've woven the technology in, in the the assumption that people are are always connected. We've woven those ever deeper into social norms, into social processes into social practices, practices 
Um, so I think we have to deal with this at a social level, societal level, mm. as well as at a personal level. I'm just curious, why does it seem easier for people just to text somebody than to call them? I think some of it is that that texting feels less intrusive mm-hmm. um, than calling. You, you feel like you're not imposing on a person. There's also evidence, and this is particularly true of young people, I think, um, and this comes from a, a sociologist named Sherry Turkle at MIT, a lot of this evidence that a lot of people feel socially safer when they text or message somebody through social media or whatever, rather than talking to them in person or even on the phone. Because if you talk to somebody in person or on the phone, then you have to react immediately. Um, And that always makes you feel a little bit vulnerable. Maybe you'll say the wrong thing. Maybe you'll make a uh, you know, a reaction you didn't intend to make. So, so by giving us this kind of social buffer zone, things like texting and, and social media uh, comments and so forth, makes us feel socially safer. And so I think that's another reason people often default to the media rather than more direct means of communication. So has this changed our thinking about communicating with someone else about something that we need to communicate with them about as being imposing on them. That's an interesting word right there to each word choice. How is, is, is that true? I would say that that's at the level of uh, hypothesis or theory. <laughs> I, mean, I think we've all had a sin, you know, or, or a lot of us. And, and I should say that some of this has to do with a person's personality personality types, introverts, or will, you know, think about this in different ways than extroverts. But I do think that there is this, uh, a sense that kind of, you know, when you call somebody, you're, you're forcing them to interrupt whatever they're doing in order to pay attention to you. When you text them, then, th- then you don't feel like you're interrupting them. They can, they can look at your text and text you back in a few minutes or whatever. So I, th- I, I think there is a less of a sense of, of imposing or making demands on another person uh, with a more mediated communication. But, but I can't say I have proof that that's what's Right. Going. But that's just a fascinating thought process to even think on that for a moment is that I think it's true. I think that, that I know people who say, well, text me before you call. Right. And so there's this, there's this new uh, social hierarchy of how we handle communication with each other as, you know, related to technology. Um, and I know that uh, I, I, I feel that myself personally, I'll feel like, Oh, I don't want to bother them. You know? <laughs> and so I'll send right. a text instead, but really and truly I want to communicate with them or connect with them. And that's not really connecting with them, you know? And so it's a, uh, it's, it's a, an interesting yeah. thing. I mean, you even saw that, you know, before texting and email came along, you know, you know, there was often comments that people who were working together in the same office just down the hall would often call one another rather than walking around. And I think even there, the, there, there was yeah. a feeling that calling is, is somewhat less intrusive than actually showing up at a person's door. So, so I think this is probably part of what's going on and it becomes, you know, it, you feel even more less intrusive when you're emailing or texting. It's interesting to look at the social norms changing because of right. technology. Um, I, I find myself as a person, one of the things I caught myself on the other day is quickly ordering something or throwing it in my cart. That's a personal item needed for the house or whatever, you know, just a household item rather than making lists anymore. I tend to go ahead and jump online real quickly, put it in my cart and later I'll close everything out, but I don't make lists anymore. I do it that way. And so that's another change. And there's also uh, Amazon's Alexa. You can just say, Alexa, add such and such to my shopping list. (laughs) That's also a way to avoid having it. So, so it does in, in both ways that in ways that are both kind of obvious and also very, very subtle Technology changes our behavior and definitely changes social norms. Wow. Well, let's talk about parents thing because, you know, I, uh, I have older kids and then I have, you know, a couple of middle school kids. And so they're, you know, they want to be heavy users of uh, social media or their phones for my, for my kids. It's just texting and talking to their friends a lot. Um, Especially this year with online learning and being separated from people 
it's right. it's something they want, right, to replace that. Um, what can parents do? What steps can we take to help with our kids with technology? Yeah, and it, it, this is a difficult area. Um, you know, I've been I've been talking about these issues now for a decade, and I remember, you know, one of the questions I always get is, how old should a should my child be before they get a, a smartphone or a cell phone, as it used to be? And what I've noticed is that 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 age for over the last ten years has gotten earlier and earlier. So ten years ago, people said that you know a right. freshman in high school, then it was you know a middle schooler, and now it's elementary, you know, fifth grade, fourth grade, third grade. Um, so even though all along parents have been worried about this and worried about for for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, worried about their their children's access to to the online world and and, and that. Even despite that, because of social pressures, the age gets earlier and earlier because the, the, the difficulty for parents is that more and more, if you don't allow your kids to have a phone or to have a Instagram account or whatever, you feel like you're going to social, you're going to isolate them socially because if all their friends in school are, are communicating this way, then not being able to communicate Kate, that way feels very limiting socially. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the big struggle uh, parents have, have had, and it's a very understandable struggle. Um, so I, I do think that that we've pushed the technology to too young an age, uh, both at home and, and, and with parents, but also with schools and, and with schools use of computers and, and such. And I think because of this social dimension, it's very, very important to deal with these things as communities um, to, you know, to for parents to get together with, if possible, with the parent parents of their children's friends and saying, can we can we all set some limits here so that one child who has limits doesn't feel left out? Mm. This, again, this is very difficult and very tricky, but I, I think it's this these kind of things that are very important, as well as, you know, thinking very carefully about the kinds of social media that are available, um, whether they're appropriate for children and at what ages, and there's a lot of variation here. And then, you know, there are tools on, on most phones and on computers now that can limit, uh, parents can use to limit what kids can see and, and use. And, and so a lot of it is just being sensitive uh, to what's out there, to the tools for, for controlling this uh, and talking with your kids and, you know, it's it's very hard and it's not going to get easier, but kind of that's that's the only way I think to know about it. I know for us that our, ours are uh, ch- choices on limitation on uh, programmed into the phone uh, too that where they shut off at a certain time and they can't have the internet anymore on it and then the device goes up, you know. Um, and of course they don't have them in school. I think it's fascinating though that you're talking about proximity of the phone itself can affect their ability to study. Absolutely. Um, And this is, you know, this was the the research that I've seen recently that was most uh, kind of shocking to me and certainly illuminating. Uh, And there was this, this study, uh, you know, I I mentioned it was, it was actually in a college lecture class uh, where they had, they broke the class into three groups. One group had to keep their phone outside of the classroom entirely. Uh, the second group could have their phone and could use it in class. And the third group could have their phone, but it had to be turned off. And what they found is that both groups who had their phones with them in class uh, scored a whole, deg- a whole grade lower on tests of the material that was presented. And it turned out not to matter whether they used their phone or not. So even just having it around means you're thinking about using it and you're thinking about all the things that could be going on and you have to suppress that desire to look at it. And that too is a distraction. So just the desire to suppress it is a distraction from what you're doing. Wow. I mean, that is, that is so valuable, you know, for those of you who have kids that are at home that are online learning, for those of you who are doing online learning of some kind, um, or writing or doing whatever you're doing with your job, that it's, it's interesting to know that, that keeping it out of the room where you're working might really improve uh, whatever you're doing. So fascinating. Um, so if you will, Nicholas, we have some audience questions. Can we move to those? Sure, sure. Okay. All right. So there used to be a claim that TV would ruin kids' brains. How do you think about that? And how does that compare with the risk of digital screen time? 
Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I think there, there's, no, there's no doubt that new technologies, particularly media technology, communication technologies, always make people worried. Um, you know, there, there's, there's two things that go on. Either people think it's going to solve all the problems of the world or they think it's going to create all the problems in the world. And I think, uh, I, I think we have to be aware of that and not be too fearful. But what I think is the, the fundamental difference is that, you know, people used to watch a lot of TV and they still do. <laughs> uh, TV viewing hasn't really gone down, even as we've added other things to do on screens. But TV viewing used to be segregated into different times of the day. You know, there was something called prime time when you were home in the evening, you'd turn on the TV with your kids maybe and watch some shows at, you know, eight o'clock at night. Uh, maybe on weekends you'd watch sports or kids would watch cartoons in the morning, but you didn't carry your TV around with you all day long. You didn't put it in front of you in your classroom. You didn't put it in front of you on your desk at your job. So there is something fundamentally different with the tech screen technology today, particularly phone technology, because we have it with us all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not like when with TV, most of the day you, you lived without your TV in front of you. And that gave you the opportunity to develop and engage in different ways of thinking and not to be kind of captured by the screen. So I do think, you know, even though we, we, we should be cognizant that uh, people have worried about these things all the time, we also need to be aware that this technology is very, very different from the technologies we've had before. So much to learn. Okay. Here's another question. There's been a lot of talk about fake news and online division and people having their own separate bubbles. You re you kind of referred to this earlier, but what do you think explains that? I guess a, a follow-up question that for that for me from Nelda is our algorithms controlling us. So <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's, I don't want to blame everything on technology. Um, <laughs> I think there are, you know, I'm sure there are political reasons and economic reasons uh, for what seems to be our increasing polarization as a, as a nation, as a country. But I do think the technology plays into that. that. Um, and as I said before, people tend to go out and seek and find information that reinforces their existing beliefs rather than go out and find information that challenges their existing beliefs. And over time, when you find more confirming information, as it's called, your views get more and more extreme. Uh, and you begin to not understand how people can possibly have uh, think in different ways than you. So I, so I do think that that uh, is playing a big role in, in the polarization. But I, and I do think that's also reinforced by the algorithms that companies like Facebook and uh, Google use. They want to provide you the information that captivates you most, str most strongly, that grabs you most strongly. And that tends to be a information that reinforces your point of view. So it's all very personalized now through the algorithms. And also, and importantly, uh, they tend to feed you very emotional information rather than logical, um, analytical information. Because again, uh, when you, when you when you when you when you're in the face of all this information coming at you all the time, it's the highly emotional messages that grab your attention, um, and so that's what these these algorithms tend to feed us. So so I do think, you know, some of it's human nature, but it's also very much. Uh, the the kind of services and products that the the design decisions by the companies that control this information uh, are also very important. Kind of like when you're looking at a pair of shoes, and the next day those shoes show up in your feed, <laughs> right? So we all know, yeah, it's big right. brothers out there watching you. So, <laughs> well, Nicholas, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the the research and the work that you've done, the books that you've written. Uh, so is there anything new on the horizon for you or anything coming up that we should know about? Um, I've been, uh, I, I've been teaching recently a, a seminar uh, to college students uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because then you really see how, how the technology is influencing social norms um, in a way that, that can be invisible to, to adults often. So I, I'm, I'm, kind of trying to gather my thoughts about 
uh, social media in general as, as kind of the, uh, you know, if the 20th century was about mass media, broadcast media, radio and TV, it seems like the media of the 21st century is something very, very different. And I don't think we, we quite have a total handle on it yet. So I'm trying to collect my thoughts about that and hopefully it leads to something interesting. Oh, that's good. You'll have to come back and see us when you get that done. So where can people follow you and learn more? Um, well, the best place, I guess, is online uh, <laughs> at my website, which is nicholascar.com. Um, and that has links to my books and other writings and my blog and, and so forth. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being on Nelda Live. Oh, thank you, Nelda. It was, uh, it was my pleasure. Look, we have lots of great interviews on Nelda Live, so hit like and subscribe. There's much more to come.